and welcome to the 26th annual Astute, Clinic, Astute Clinician Lecture. I'm Colleen Hadigan, the Chief Medical Officer and the Clinical Director at the NIH Clinical Center. And today's special lecture is an NIH Director's Wednesday afternoon lecture series event hosted by the Clinical Center. We are pleased to welcome both in-person attendees and all of our participants who are watching through the NIH video webcast. Dr. Tabak, unfortunately, uh, was unable to join us today um, due to other commitments. Today's, just a little housekeeping, today's CME code is 50097. Please text this code to the Johns Hopkins CME phone number on the slide to receive your CME credits for participation at this lecture. Finally, last piece of housekeeping, during the lecture, if you have questions, please submit them for Dr. Sears anytime during the lecture by clicking the live feedback button located on the videocast website, and Dr. Sears will ha have an opportunity to answer those questions as time permits at the conclusion of the lecture. For individuals in the room, they can go to one of the mics when asking a question. So first, the astute clinician lectureship is established through a gift from the late Robert Miller and his wife, Haruko. It honors a U.S. scientist who has observed an unusual clinical occurrence and then by investigating it has opened an important new avenue of research. It is an honor to introduce Cynthia Sears, an infectious disease expert in gut and foodborne infections. Dr. Sears' presentation, titled Sleuthing the Microbiome, reveals, un reveals undercover agents of oncogenesis. This will provide context for microbe promotion of colon carcinogenesis as illustrated by two vignettes, one defined by a single bacterial gene and a second revealing community potential to mold disease. Dr. Sears earned her MD from Thomas Jefferson Medical College and completed her internal medicine residency and fellowship at N um, NY Hospital Wheel Cornell Medical Center. In 1985, Dr. Sears began her teaching journey as an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Virginia before transitioning to Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she is still today. Dr. Sears is a physician, a mentor, and also professor of medicine and oncology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Notably, she leads the microbiome program at the Bloomberg Kimmel Institute for Cancer Immunotherapy at Johns Hopkins and is director of the Johns Hopkins Germ-Free Murine Facility. The lab is currently conducting human and murine studies to determine if and how microbiome impacts clinical responses to cancer immunotherapy. As an infectious disease expert, Dr. Sears studied gut infections including diarrheal and foodborne illnesses such as C. diff and helicobacter during her career. In her laboratory and in clinical settings, she has studied the pathogenesis of enterotoxigenic B. fragilis over the past 25 years. The current focus of the Sears laboratory is to determine how the microbiota and specific bacterial uh, pathogens contribute to colon carcinogenesis. The laboratory integrates studies of human and mouse models employing microbiology, bioinformatics, immunology, um, and other scientific methods. Dr. Sears has worked abroad in Thailand, Brazil, Haiti, Bangladesh, and Malaysia. Dr. Sears also has served as the editor the associate editor of the journal Clinical Infectious Disease between 2000 and 2016, and was appointed editor-in-chief of the Journal of Infectious Disease in January of 2022. She is a member of the External Advisory Board of Digestive Disease Research Center at Vanderbilt and Columbia University, has been an active member of IDSA for more than 20 years, serving the society in numerous capacities, and is currently the president of that organization. In 2021, she was awarded the Johns Hopkins Cancer Center Mentoring Award. Dr. Sears is recognized globally for her scientific expertise and is a true role model as a caring, compassionate clinician to all of her patients. Dr. Sears exemplifies the traits and that for the honorees upon this lectureship 
which was created 26 years ago. So with no further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Sears. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'll just correct one thing. I was president of IDSA in 2019, so I'm not the current president, uh, not to uh, try to take that honor today. <laughs> so I want to first thank uh, Dr. Miller and his family for uh, supporting this lecture, and then uh, Dr. Gilman and the NIH committee for selecting me for the honor of speaking today, and to all of you uh, here and, uh, and online who have joined uh, to listen. So the title, as you've already heard, is Sleuthing the Microbiome Reveals Undercover Agents of Oncogenesis. I have a few disclosures that are not particularly germane, and today I hope to give you a framework for thinking about how we consider microbes in the pathogenesis of human colon cancer and talk to you a little bit about specific bacteria as well as communities that may be contributing to the disease. So the over overarching hypothesis is the gut microbiome is a critical environmental factor impacting disease and therapeutic outcomes. That certainly is not unique to our group. But if we step back to the field of infectious diseases, I think we mu now must consider that antibiotic exposure over life through its microbiome impacts is an ever-evolving disease modifier, potentially with high impact on chronic disease development. And so, as Colleen just said, I'm going to present data today where we toggle between human studies and murine studies and back again to try to understand how the microbiome is affecting disease. So this is the big picture uh, for the field. On one end of the spectrum, we're considering the impact of single species. The three that get discussed most often are listed here, Fusobacterium nucleatum subspecies, polyketide synthase, positive Escherichia coli, and enterotoxigenic uh, Bacteroides fragilis. And the picture here illustrates that we can take a mouse and add one bug to its microbiome and lead to a complete change of phenotype dependent on a toxin it makes and IL-17 in the right genetic context. And that genetic context is a mouse that is heterozygous for the gene APC, which stands for adenomatous polyposis coli, and is the gene that's mutated in the hereditary colon cancer syndrome known as familial adenomatous polyposis. This gene is also mutated in over 80 percent of all sporadic uh, colon cancer. Each of the bacteria I just listed have substantive connections to colon cancer in humans in the literature. Now, on the other side of the equation is the idea that microbial community is important to disease development. And in this cartoon, what I'm showing you is the entire colon is covered with two layers of mucus. One is a loose layer of mucus. Mucus is readily invaded by bacteria. And the second is this dense layer of mucus that stretches along the axis of the colon and is largely sterile, except when the right bugs come along and are able to penetrate that and pierce it and then sit right on top of the epithelial cells. And studying these biofilms has led us to concepts in carcinogenesis, as well as to a surprising uh, potential contributor uh, to colon cancer. So I'm going to tell you two vignettes, as was mentioned already today. One is the power of one, and I'm going to use as the model enterotoxigenic bacteroides fragilis, which, as mentioned, we have been studying for a long time. And the second is the power of community, and these will be some observations from studies of biofilms. So we'll turn to the first vignette and talk about enterotoxigenic bacteroides fragilis, or I'll call them ETBF. Oops, sorry, I did that too fast. There we go. So where in the world did ETBF come from? These are not a household name. 
in clinical medicine. And it turns out these organisms were discovered by Dr. Lyle Meyer as a veterinary scientist at Montana State University in the mid-1980s. And he took on this perplexing problem of diarrheal disease in newborn lambs, which appeared not to follow the usual path of other diarrheal diseases. And really in an elegant series of experiments, trying to figure out what was going on at the end of the day, he came to the conclusion that it was this Bacteroides fragilis strain in the loop that was stimulating the secretion. And in fact, when he put the supernatants from that bug into additional ligated loops, they blew up so much with fluid that they would burst, very similar to what you can see in cholera toxin. Now, Dr. Brad Sack at the Bloomberg School of Public Health was a sleuth of childhood diarrhea. And at that time, childhood diarrhea across the globe was the number one cause of morbidity and mortality. And only about half of diarrheal disease could actually be explained. So he noticed Dr. Meyer's work and then took it to the field where he went to the Indian Health, Indian Health Service Hospital in White River, Arizona and did an epidemiology study linking uh, ETBF to human uh, diarrheal disease. And when I first went to Hopkins, uh, Dr. Sack called me up and literally came to my office with this tube of 20-fold concentrated culture supernatants from an ETBF strain that Dr. Myers had sent him and said, all the assays we typically do in diarrheal disease to detect toxins have failed. I hear you work with colon epithelial cells. Will you take this? and see what you can do. And so fortunately, we were working with these human colon cancer cells called HT29C1 cells, and having this tool, you can see on the top the control cells, and you can see what happens after you add either purified BFT or some of that culture supernatant to it. We suddenly had a tool in which it allowed us to go on and find the BFT gene and purify the toxin, learning that, in fact, it was active at very low concentrations. And this is an assay that we still use uh, today. So stepping forward, it turns out that ETBF is characterized by a single virulence factor, which is the Bacteroides fragilis, or BFT gene. And this is a pre-pro-protein toxin. It's, it's uh, developed by the organism and molded by the organism and secreted as a mature 20 kilodalton protein. It is a zinc-dependent metal protease toxin, and it's usually due to a single chromosomal gene uh, in the organism. Occasionally, there's two copies. And on the right here, it shows you the spectrum of what happens with Bacteroides fragilis. And Probably close to 90% of us listening today are colonized with B. frag. At one end of the spectrum are the non-toxigenic Bacteroides fragilis, which are thought to be very important to development of the mucosal immune system in the work done by Dr. Dennis Casper at Harvard. And at the other end of the spectrum are these B. frag strains that are pro-inflammatory and tumorigenic, as I will show you. And so in humans, data has also accrued associating ETBF with inflammatory diarrheal disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and colon cancer. Now, this is one of those slides where I've summarized my life on, and many others on one slide. So let me walk you through this. So the first thing I want to do is to review the timeline. So this is now, again, in that APC heterozygous mouse which with a single inoculation to the mouse, we can get colonization. And it turns out we get initiation of tumor formation very quickly so that by one week, you can see these microscopic tumors in the, in the colon mucosa of the mouse due to loss of heterozygosity. And of course, over time, they grow until they're bigger tumors. And I want to point out how important to these studies Dr. Shiguan Wu and Dr. Franck Cousseau were. They have really walked with me uh, for the last 25 years in developing these data. So the first thing I want to tell you is about the toxin. Indeed, I've mentioned that this is the virulence factor of note. 
And here is, let's see if I can do it, there we go. And here's the evidence for that. If we take the organism and do an in-frame deletion mutant, so the toxin gene is no longer there, we obliterate all that tumor genesis and inflammation. So only when that gene is there do you see any of these biological effects in the mice. Now, the next step in this process that we studied was egan herring cleavage activation of CMYC and cell proliferation. Now, how did that come to be? Well, early on in the 1990s, I was presenting at a conference, and as I walked away from the podium, Dr. James Nelson, chair of the Department of Cell Biology at Stanford, stopped me and said, you know, there's something about those cells that makes me think of E. Ken Heron. I have some reagents. Why don't I send them to you and see what you think? So indeed he did, and this Western blot shows that, in fact, uh, Dr. Nelson was spot on. So in the first lane is a blot showing E. Herin, which is a 120 kilodalton protein that is, is key to the adherence junction and holds those colonic epithelial cells together. And lanes two and forward show what happens after addition of BFT to the HT29 cells, and what you see is this rapid cleavage over 30 to 45 minutes of the e heron and what the, the blot down here is showing you, the residual intracellular domain, and when e heron gets cleaved, it releases this 80 kilodalton extracellular fragment, which I'll come back to and show you uh, in a moment. Now, let's see, what happened? Whoops, you know what, I, I must have hit. There we go. Okay, there's my cartoon. So what happened next was two things. Bert, Pat Warren, Bert Vogelstein, Ken Kinsler at Hopkins published seminal papers in science demonstrating that the Wnt pathway was critical to the development of colon uh, cancer. And simultaneously, I did an experiment that I forgot to stop and came back in the next morning and looked in the incubator, and lo and behold, uh, the tissue culture flask was bright yellow. So I thought, I not only messed up the experiment, I contaminated the flask. But when I looked under the microscope, in fact, the media was clear. And what had happened is overnight, the cells had proliferated madly and had used up all the glucose in the media. So we had never done longer experiments, so it was a new observation. And so here's a cartoon of what we think happens. So I mentioned e heron is the structural protein of the zonal adherence, part of the tight junctional complex in the colon, and tethered to the intracellular domain of e heron is this little pool of beta-catenin, which at the time was thought to be biologically inert. However, we knew that BFT bound to a specific receptor. We didn't know what it was on the cell. We showed that e heron got cleaved. And in fact, we went on to show that beta catenin, in fact, translocated to the nucleus, activated CMYC, and led to cell proliferation. Now, as we continued forward trying to understand this process in the mouse, we learned that the toxin-induced DNA damage, as shown here by gamma H2AX staining, which is a measure of double-stranded DNA breaks uh, and indicative of DNA damage. And then with Drew Pardol's help, who's here in the audience today, uh, we uh, studied additional transduction pathways and identified that PSTAT3 was activated amongst all the stats, and that activation of the phosphorylation, that protein, is critical to the production of IL-17, which proved to be pro-carcinogenic in this model. Now, Frank and his team helped us further pull this apart, and what we ultimately learned is, is that the IL-17 receptor on the colonic epithelial cell is what is critical to the carcinogenesis. And once that receptor is engaged by IL-17, there's NF-kappa B activation, release from the epithelial cell CXCL chemokines, and then that pulls in all these immature myeloid cells just to the distal colon where we see the tumors that is so important to the tumor genesis that the pictures show. 
Now, meanwhile, Shiguan and I had tried for years to figure out what the BFT receptor was, and we, through an siRNA library, uh, we zeroed in on GPR35, a GTB binding protein that is uh, prevalent and, and has a high expression level uh, in the gut. However, that was not the receptor. When you knock out that particular protein, you actually get more tumors, not less tumors. So it remained a puzzle what the BFT toxin was binding to. Enter uh, Max White, who's an MST, talented MSTP student at Johns Hopkins. And from this first time I met Max and he told him about this problem, he got fascinated by it. And I was very fortunate to have him join the lab. And he posited that BFT needed help from some component of an intact cell to cleave E. cadherin. And so in today's world, he took on a different type of genetic screen, and in this case, it was a CRISPR-Cas9 library in HT29 cells. And it turned out that Matt Waldor um, at, at Harvard had actually already made this library. And Matt is a diarrheal disease investigator. So we called him up and he invited Max to his lab who worked with Heilong Zhang uh, to test the library. And so in the first run, the, the assay that was used to screen the library was looking for loss of E. cadherin. And what Max chose to do is to sort out the top 10% of cells that were still expressing E. cadherin, thinking that, in fact, those cells must have lost a gene through the library that was critical to the action of BFT. And then on deep se sequencing those cells in that very first run, one gene popped out as significant, and that was Cloudin-4. Max went back and repeated the entire screen, and on the second time through, additional genes came up, but Cloudin-4 became further enriched. So now I'm going to show you a subset of the experiments that Max has done to try to understand if Cloudin-4 may be a receptor for the BFT, um, BFT protein. And so in the first figure here, uh, what I'm showing you is that cl at Cloudin-4 knockout cells, these are HT HT29 cells, lose stable BFT binding. So in the blots here, you can see that in the wild type cells, you can detect cloud in four, and you can detect the binding of BFT. If you knock out cloud in four in those cells, you lose both of those signals. If you knock out cloud in three as a possible control, those signals are still there because cloud in four is still there. In the flow plots, you can see that when BFT binds the cells, it shifts the cells to the right because this protein has been added to the cells. If you use the C, uh, the clown for knockout cells, they don't move because the protein won't bind. And lastly, if you use the clown three knockout cells, they again move very similar to wild type. The second type of protocol Max used was to test if the toxin would co-immunoprecipitate with cloud and four, and indeed that's what this blot shows, that if he used an anti-cloud and four antibody, he got the cloud and four and the BFT at the same time. If he used an anti-cloud and two antibody, he did not get those signals. The next protocol he used was to use HEK 293T cells, and these have no endogenous E. cadherin or cloudins. So what he did was he transfected in cloudin-4, and this plot shows whether the protein, the cloudin-4, was um, fluorescently labeled or not, that in fact that restored binding of BFT to the cells, whereas transfecting in cloudin-2 did not restore that binding. And lastly, he put the whole system together. So here he took the HEK 293 T cells again, and he labeled E. cadherin with uh, M. cherry as a fluorescent probe and, and, and transfected that into uh, these cells. And here shows the flow plot showing you the position 
of the E. cadherin um, on the surface of the cells. And if he adds BFT to that just expressing E. cadherin, that signal doesn't move at all. But if he co-transfects in the Cloudin-4, he in fact, and then adds the BFT, you see the signal move because the E. cadherin has now been cleaved, and there's that 80 kilodalton extracellular domain that has been uh, released. Oops. So what happens next? Well, Max is working on Cloudin-4 mutational analyses. And in this case, this is a, a cartoon, obviously, of Cloudin-4, which is a transmembrane protein. And he so far has taken off this C-terminus signaling domain, and that actually has very little effect on the binding of BFT. And we thought that the larger extracellular domain would probably be very important to the binding of BFT, but in fact, that's not correct either. It turns out that little extracellular domain, the smaller nubbin, is what's critical to the binding of BFT, although we strongly suspect that the two domains are interacting. Oops, I'm so sorry, it's a little sensitive. Okay, the other thing we're doing is we're uh, discussing with Dr. Xavier Gomez-Ruth and his colleague Ulrich Eckhardt at the Molecular Biology Institute of Barcelona modeling this system. It turns out that Dr. Gomez Ruth is the only person who has crystallized a BFT ever uh, in the world. And so uh, we set up a Zoom call and, and have had a wonderful time uh, working through this problem with them. And if you have questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them at the end. So, Stepping back, Max has written a very nice review that got published this month in Nature Review's Microbiology. This is what we think is actually the list of credible, credible bacterial contributors to colon cancer uh, pathogenesis. There is 11 of them on this list. And as we look at the linkage for all but Salmonella typhimurium, the linkage, there is some human linkage, epidemiologic data, to suggest that these could be relevant to colon cancer. When we move to animal models, it gets slimmer because many of these organisms don't readily colonize a mouse, mice, but you can see that a few do, and so there's opportunities to study in more detail the mechanisms of those particular organisms. So now I'm going to turn to vignette two, and here we'll talk about the power of community and discoveries with biofilms. So I'm going to start with a clinical study that we did uh, working with Zha Zha Zhang. And the basic question we were asking, this was published in Gut, was is there an association between any oral antibiotic use and the development of colon uh, cancer? And so we were fortunate enough to get funding from Dr. Paul Otwater, who runs an environmental program at Hopkins, and we were able to buy the data from the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, which has data from 1989 to 2012 at the time we did this, so longitudinal data. And this is the largest clinical database uh, in the world. And working with their scientists, we did a matched a design where the in the controls and the cancer, the colon cancers, are matched by year of birth, gender, practice site, and the CRPD registration date. And so we had the opportunity to look at almost 29,000 colon can colorectal cancers and almost 138,000 controls. And the core results are shown here. On the, on the uh, horizontal axis are total days of exposure to oral antibiotics. And the striking and unexpected finding was that by day 15 of total antibiotic exposure of an individual in the database, the association, of, there was an increased association with the incidence of colon cancer. In contrast, if we looked at rectal cancer, in fact, exposure to antibiotics led to decreased risk that seemed to level out at about day 60. 
Now we were able to take some of those colon cancers and figure out where they were from the database. And some were proximal and some were distal. And you can see 100% of the signal for colon cancer traced to the proximal colon with no effect in the distal colon. So one other piece of information that we found convincing was that this association with oral antibiotic exposure only mattered for oral antibiotics taken more than 10 years previously. So this was not confounding by indication and that is the magic number used in the field from the time that you get the start of a colon cancer till it becomes a polyp and the gastroenterologist can see it. Subsequently, or actually, the Harvard Nurses Health Study was published just before ours, and a subsequent study out of Sweden also validated this idea that the oral antibiotic exposure and subsequent colon cancer would be distant in time. So for me, this highlights how antibiotic-mediated microbiome shifts may contribute to chronic disease uh, development. So now let me tell you more about biofilms. So, and this is the work of Christine De Gea and subsequently Julia Druess. So in the top figure here, this is the healthy colon and that very light blue stain that you're seeing is that dense inner mucus layer that sits right on the epithelial cells. And to do this project, well, we, we sort of rocked back and said, oh, there's a lot of bugs in the gut and maybe we shouldn't put all our um, all our money in one bucket. So let's back off and try to look in a broader way at how bacteria may be affecting colon cancer. So we went to the pathology suite and we got pieces of tumor uh, from the surface and we got pieces of tumor from the far distal margin of a surgical resection, which is usually about half the colon, and brought them back to the lab. And then we um, hybridized them with a bacterial 16S rRNA probe to detect all bacteria that were there. And to our surprise, you can see that pink. That pink is a mass of bacteria sitting right on top of the colon tumor and on top of the epithelial cells and the nuclei of the cells are stained in blue by DAPI. And in addition, if you take that normal flanking, it also had these dense aggregates of invasive an invasive biofilm present as well. And almost always, if the tumor shows a biofilm, the flanking normal way away from the tumor is also going to show that, leading us to believe that probably those bacteria are all along the swath of the tissue. Now, we wanted to know what those bacteria were, and so we use a variety of probes. And the bottom line is all of these uh, biofilms are, in fact, polymicrobial. And when we did this staining, what we could see is that the bacteria invaded the tumor. So every tumor with a positive biofilm has an intratumor bacterial population. The next thing we did was go to the colon uh, colonoscopy suite to see patients who are average risk for colon cancer. And there we learned there and subsequently that about 10 to 15 percent of individuals undergoing colonoscopy will also have biofilms, but they're skinny, and they're also polymicrobial sitting on top of the cells. Now, in additional work over time, we came to understand that this was a spectrum of bacteria, but with three flavors, if you will. Most are polymicrobial, that's showing a predominance of bacteroidetes and lactobacillus. There's a large subset that also have fusobacterium blooms as shown in the yellow. And then there's a tiny subset that is made up of a complex of different proteobacteria or gram-negative rods. Now, I'm disappointed uh, to say that, in fact, we still don't know who exactly is sitting in those invasive biofilms. But Carol Caroline Wenzel, who's a cell molecular medicine graduate student, has taken on this challenge and is analyzing the data now, so hopefully we'll know soon. Now, we were doing this study at Hopkins, and we decided to set up a parallel study with some funding in Malaysia. And so in this cartoon on the left of the colon, 
All the red dots represent biofilm positive tumors we examine, and all the blue dots are biofilm negative tumors. And what you can see in the summation over here is that almost 90 percent of right colon tumors will have biofilms. Remember that antibiotic slide. In contrast, only about half of the tumors in the left colon are positive. And when you go to the colonoscopy suite, it's agnostic to side. 10 to 15 percent will show biofilms. Now, in data I don't have time to show you, but I wish to tell you is we've learned these biofilms can be procarcinogenic. They aren't always procarcinogenic, pro but they can be. And we can tell that because in the tissue, human tissues, we see decreased barrier function by loss of E. cadherin. And we see activation of carcinogenic mucosal and colonic epithelial cell pathways like IL-6 and STAT-3. And we see that the biofilms are associated with colon epithelial cell proliferation. And then when we put tumors into mice, slurries of human tumors into mice, we in fact get induction of tumors in those um, min mice. Now, Julia Drewis took on the difficult challenge of trying to figure out if the biofilms in each person were pro-carcinogenic. And in her initial analysis, she tripped upon, uh, basically, a, a tumor, 3728T, from a 69-year-old man with stage 1 adenocarcinoma in the right colon, that in fact what's plotted here are numbers of tumors. Uh, and this particular slurry was pro-carcinogenic. And here is shown the tumors in the distal gut. She cultured it to figure out how many bugs were there. And a bit to our surprise, we didn't find BFRAG. We didn't find Fusobacterium nucleatum. We, didn't, we found E. coli, but it wasn't PKS positive. But we did notice that it had a Clostridium difficile in there. So she did. She tested this isolates now, and in fact, that replicated the result with the slurry. Now, she did the obvious next experiment. She pulled the C. diff out of the isolates and looked at what happened. And indeed, what you can see here is that without the C. diff, the, I can't control my pointer, there we go. Without the C. diff, the isolates do not lead to tumor formation. They only lead to tumor formation, the presence of the CTIF. These are some additional uh, experiments we did to try to confirm these observations. So Julia had identified a slurry from a patient that was not particularly tumorigenic. So what she did was she added the C. diff to that particular slurry, and indeed it did convert it to be carcinogenic in the mouse model. This is numbers of tumors that are plotted here. Jada Domange, now at AstraZeneca, doing an entirely different project in the lab on biofilm negative tumors, had one sample, whoops, sorry about that, had one sample that led to a large number of tumors as shown here. And she decided, because of what Julia had observed in the lab, to look for C. diff, and indeed, that too was C. difficile positive. Angela Chen, who is obtaining her PhD uh, in the Molecular Microbiology Immunology Group, uh, took on the challenge of seeing if the system worked in specific pathogen-free mice, and indeed, she ordered toxigenic strains and non-toxigenic strains of C. diff from ATCC, and again, the toxigenic strains induced tumors, whereas the non-toxigenic uh, did not. So many of you in this room and online know that clostridioides, now called that, difficile infection is a disease precipitated by antibiotic exposure and microbial shifts. Uh, this is an obligate anaerobe, and importantly, it produces two toxins, toxin A and toxin B, but it's toxin B that is thought to be most relevant to human disease. We now know this is now the most common healthcare-associated infection in the U.S. It's a leading cause of gastroenteritis death in the U.S., but we really don't know 
much of anything about its persistence in the gut. We know that C. diff recurs in an acute fashion, but we actually have no data on how after C. diff, how many people hang on to it for a, per, for a protracted uh, period of time. Now, in, Julia Drews published her results with Angela Chen and others in Cancer Discovery, and she provided evidence to link four mechanisms to the carcinogenicity of C. difficile. But today I'm only going to show you a little bit of data about the biofilms and the linkage to the toxin, and then I'm going to show you some unpublished data where we're working on the community, which I think uh, is very interesting. So here again, we're back to the mouse, and what Julia did is she inoculated the mice with all the isolates, but not the C. diff. And so in these pictures, the pink is just the mass of bacteria in the lumen of the gut, and that black space between the pink and the blue, which is the nuclei of the epithelial cells, is that black space, and that's that inner mucus layer, which is largely not penetrated here, although occasionally it is, even with the isolates, as you can see in this picture. Now, if you look at this picture on the right, which is um, an increased um, magnification, you do not see bacteria in the crypts of the uh, colon epithelium. If you look at the bottom now, this is the isolates inoculated with C. diff. And the structure of the biofilm is dramatically different. Uh, in addition, if you look at the photo on the far right, now these bacteria are reaching down into the crypts, which is where the colonic stem cells are, which is the progenitor cell for colon cancer. And I, don't, I think over here you can see it, those yellow rods, those are the C. diff. So it's not because there's an overwhelming amount of C. diff there. They, it's because they change the function of the community. Now, with the help of Dean Lyris and Borden Leish, because C. diff is very hard to mutate, we obtained some strains that had the toxin be knocked out. And indeed, when Julia treated the mice or uh, colonized mice with the toxin B strains, they colonized just fine but they did not induce tumors, like the toxin to B positive strains. So C. difficile positive um, community induces tumors that, again, is, appears to be driven by a single virulence gene of C. diff, which is toxin B. So now I'm going to describe really what we're doing today, and this is the work of Hadley Beauregard, who's also a cell and molecular medicine graduate student. And earlier work on this was done by Reese Knippel, a pic show his picture in a moment, uh, who is a postdoc working in the lab. So we got interested in what are the rest of those isolates doing in that biofilm? And so I want to describe the two experimental protocols, and then I'll show you the data. So in the first protocol, we're examining how the culture supernatants from some of the bacteria in that biofilm might influence the growth of C. difficile. And this was done by growing the strains for 72 hours, filter sterilizing them, getting rid of the bugs, and then putting the C. diff back in and seeing if it grows or it doesn't. In the second protocol, it was basically doing the same thing, but using the culture supernatant at 72 hours after the C. diff was added and it grew to see how much toxin was being produced by the C. diff on that culture. And over here are Vero cells, which is a classic assay for C. difficile toxins. On the top are the normal cells, and on the bottom they round up when they see uh, toxin A or toxin B, it turns out. Okay, so Reese had done this phenomenally complicated set of experiments to try to figure out which bugs in that 30-member community were important uh, to uh, interacting with C. diff. And the one that popped out from his work was this Klebsiella pneumoniae. So hang on to that thought. So in this figure, 
is the positive control, is the blue line on the top. So you put C. diff in fresh media, it grows just fine. If you take that media at 72 hours, filter sterilize it, and re-inoculate it with C. diff on the red line on the bottom, it doesn't grow at all. However, if you take 72-hour culture filtrates of a range of gram-negative rods, including the Klebsiella pneumoniae, and re-inoculate with C. diff, they all grow pretty well, as shown here. So we think or we know that, proteo, that culture supernames of proteobacteria can, in fact, restore C. difficile growth. And this is the experiment done, additional experiment done by Reese, who also is now at AstraZeneca. And in the zero column is whether or not he took all those isolates, he grew them up for 72 hours, fil filter sterilized them, grew the C. diff, and then tested the toxin production in that culture soup. And in it, without the addition, in just the C. diff alone, this is the level of toxin production you see. And as you add progressively more of the culture supernatant from the, from the other bugs, you in fact get reduction in toxin production. I'll tell you one more thing. We've now, um, this factor in those culture supernatants appears to be less than four kilodaltons. It's heat, lipase, and protease uh, resistant. So we're suspicious of a small molecule, potentially a metabolite, that's mediating these effects. So over here is our working hypothesis, that you take C. diff and its helper bugs in those biofilms, and you put them together and you get less toxin production by C. diff, but you sustain its growth, which we're considering a perfect storm. Namely, the helper strains in the colonic microbiome promote the growth of the organism by dimini but diminish its toxin production, which enables it to remain as a permanent or a, a, a chronic colonizer of the human gut, limiting the amount of inflammation that's uh, induced. And we know that inflammation is critical to the development of colon cancer. So next steps, well, does C. diff have a plausible linkage to colon cancer? It's really a completely new topic. But we've started to look, and if we go to our Malaysian cohort, we've now sequenced 110 colon cancers from that cohort, and 29 of the 110 are positive for C. difficile uh, in the sequence analyses. 25 of the 29 of those are, in fact, biofilm positive. When we look at our Hopkins colon cancer cohort, which has been depleted over time, so we've only been able to look at six colon cancers to date, five of six were positive for C. difficile, and two were toxigenic. And other possible things to think about as we consider this is that we know that pediatric clostridium difficile disease has increased over time, and we know we have new epidemiology in colon cancer with the onset of early onset colorectal cancer, which we're seeing in individuals under the age of 50 before screening colonoscopy uh, is typically recommended. And lastly, we know in inflammatory bowel disease that there is a ton of C. difficile colonization and or disease, and that is a condition that also has increased risk of colon cancer development. So what are we actually doing? Well, Cynthia Say, a GI fellow in the lab, and Sean Anderson, an ID fellow in the lab, are re-examining what, how often we're all exposed to C. difficile, looking at antibody, IgG antibodies to toxin B. We've uh, collected 400 samples of serage at, at Hopkins, both pediatric and adult, and are in the process of trying to get that done. We've also uh, initiated a longitudinal hospital-based C. difficile colonization study, which will be a 12-month study in adults, and we hope to extend it to outpatients and pediatrics, again, led by Sean Anderson and Cynthia Zay, two 
get the initial C. diff isolate, the isolates potentially over time, how long is the organism carried, and what is the community it's associated with. And lastly, we're trying to query large databases, both at Hopkins and ultimately network hospitals, to try to look at the intersection of C. difficile infection, colonoscopy, and colorectal cancer detection. And this is being led by an all-star group in the ID division, and I am mostly an observer learner here, uh, but Sean is working on this with Matthew Robinson, Ailey Klein, Sarah Cosgrove, and Kelly Gibo at Hopkins. So with that, I want to turn to some tributes. And obviously, I'm standing here uh, because of the support and mentorship I received over time. And so I want to thank Dick Garant, who was my first mentor at University of Virginia, who took me into his lab despite the fact I had no idea how to pipette. And Julie Sando, who is in the Department of Pharmacology there, uh, I was the first MD person she let work in her lab, and I learned a tremendous amount. We were still fast friends. Um, and in particular, I learned a lot about writing, as she dubbed me uh, the queen of the misplaced modifier. At Johns Hopkins, I was co-hired by Mark Donowitz, then head of GI, and John Bartlett, head of ID, and received enormous support from them over the last uh, decades. I already told you how invaluable getting to know Dr. Sack was. And lastly, Drew Pardol. It's now almost 20 years since I told him I didn't know anything about the mucosal immune system and could he help me out? And indeed he has, and we remain uh, wonderful collaborators. I also want to really uh, thank Shiguan Wu and Augusto Franco. They were here, there with me in the beginning. Shiguan has decided to retire this year, and I'm largely heartbroken uh, over that revelation. And Augusto Franco lost his life to lymphoma in the early 2000s, but the work he did on the genetics of ETBF stands uh, today. And of course, there are many other people, both the current lab and prior labs, that have contributed to this project, as well as innumerable people who have collaborated with us over time. And I owe a deep uh, gratitude to the people who, the institutions that have funded us, and that really it's the NIH is the foundation of that. And it's mostly been NIDDK and NCI, although we did get one NIAID grant at one time. And lastly, but not leastly, all the generous patients who have worked with us. And one day I came back, and indeed my door had been adorned, uh, and it's now been there for at least a decade, uh, and of course says we'll work for still, which remains absolutely true. So thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone's free to uh, use, please, Dr. Gallen, you can kick us off. Just relates. Just, okay, there's Steve. Just waiting I'm for sorry. it to turn on. Go ahead. Good, good, good. My Go question ahead. relates to the sort of the end stimulus. So, do you think the bugs and the toxins you've described are directly stimulating the colon cells to transform into malignancy? Or, as you suggested several times, are they creating this massive inflammatory reaction? whose reactive oxygen species and other products are inducing the transformation? Yeah, I think this is a big debate in the field. So the one organism on that list that's being uh, considered as possibly targeting the DNA and that and transforming the cells is the colobactin made by the polyketide synthase E. coli. I, however, don't think the evidence holds up uh, for that conclusion as yet. And I really think these organisms are promotional. That in fact, I don't know what causes the mutation of APC that's foundational to colon cancer, but I really think the bugs are coming in and creating, as you just said, the, the context for the development of cancer. Because it would be easy when, with using the toxins to see what effect they have for example, on phagocytic cells 
and other cells to generate, say, huge uh, generation of reactive oxygen species. We, we did that once uh, with Jerry Donowitz, who you probably know, uh, trying to look at uh, BFT's effect on polys. And there was no effect that we could detect. So the, the cloud, if the cloud four is a receptor for BFT, I don't think it's on most of those cells anyway. And so there doesn't, at least with that toxin, and we haven't studied the others, um, I don't think it's direct on the immune system. I think it's a cascade from the lumen to the submucosa and back to the epithelial cells, at least with uh, ETBF, it's the feedback of IL-17 on the epithelial cell that seems to really trigger the epithelial cell to change its function. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right, I have a couple questions online. So um, did the antibiotic data have sufficient detail to see if some antibiotics are associated with higher colon risk compared to other antibiotics? So I didn't say this, but when we drilled down uh, into that question, it turned out that the associated antibiotic was penicillin, of all things. And I must admit, I probably was a little surprised, but uh, penicillin has uh, a variety of uh, activity against uh, anaerobes, and particularly uh, when every time we take an oral antibiotic, it's not completely absorbed, so every single time it hits the colon and it modifies the microbiome. And it's an impossible question to study, but I think that those serial shifts somehow change the biology of the mucus layer there and make it more uh, amenable uh, to biofilm invasion and some of the uh, effects that we've seen. And I, that result got further reinforced when we looked at people that only had ever taken penicillin versus any other antibiotic, and actually the results held up, hmm. even under those circumstances. Another question may have anticipated this answer. Uh, so were there any fungi in the biofilms? You know, we, ha we you know, I, I happen to like bacteria, <laughs> so we've really focused on bacteria, and we haven't we haven't dealt. There are a few papers out there now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have a lot to learn about viruses, parasites, and fungi, how they may influence colon cancer. Okay, well, that's it online. Dr. Hadigan, if you want to. So I, I just want to thank Dr. Sears again for a fantastic lecture. Um, thank everybody for attending and then let those individuals who are present here know that there's a reception outside Lipset. Uh, I hope you'll be able to join us and maybe have an opportunity to meet Dr. Sears. So thank you everybody.